Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this Friday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Uh, first, has weather graphic, hazardous weather graphic. Uh, we've got a winter weather advisory continuing here for the eastern Alaska range uh, for until 6 a.m. Saturday morning. Looking for another two to four inches of snow to fall in that area tonight on top of what you've already picked up there. Um, some areas have picked up about two to four inches already, especially the higher elevations, which above uh, 2,000 feet or 3,000, obviously will pick up even higher amounts than that. Otherwise, uh, winter weather advisories that are currently out until 6 p.m. for the uh, Kobuk Valley and up in the northwest area, southern slopes of the Western Brooks Range, those end at 6 p.m this evening, even though light snow will probably continue in well into the night. And from there, looking at the breakup chart, uh, Cusquam River down here, pretty much open now all the way down. There's still some ice floating down the river there, but it's uh, basically done with the breakup. And of course, the uh, Susitna Rivers and Copper Rivers are pretty well open. And some mostly open now showing up here just east of Eagle. <clears throat> along the Yukon, otherwise some open areas, all the way out until it meets the porcupine here. The Yukon from there on down is uh, still mostly ice, although there's some areas along there that are pretty uh, melted out or kind of rotten ice as they call it, especially down over the Yukon Delta, northern rivers, still pretty solid. So moving on to the fire danger graphic here, and with the uh, precipitation that's moved into the eastern interior Copper River Basin uh, overnight and today, that's pretty well uh, made it uh, or put it down to low fire danger. And now we have this uh, lingering area up here, mostly north of the Yukon River around the Porcupine River. And this is for uh, grass fuels, not spruce or anything uh, bigger than that, but still high to very high here. Some areas making it barely into the high zone, but that. Uh, up there toward the eastern Brooks Range, southern slopes there, again, mostly north of the Yukon River. And from there, satellite imagery, you can see the uh, clouds associated with the moisture and the rainfall uh, and snowfall here over the eastern interior Copper River Basin and along the eastern Alaska Range as well. And that extends down into the southeast coast, kind of exiting the area today with a few showers down there. You can see uh, earlier on before it moved through. That brought about a quarter of an inch of rain to some areas uh, of the southeast coast today and that's uh, starting to taper off now. We've got another system back here to the southwest just uh, grazing Kodiak Island today with uh, looks like mostly cloudiness. And that's going to take off to the northeast, stay south of the North Gulf Coast here. But as it does pull up, it'll tend to enhance the shower activity over the Copper River Basin once again. And again, be in form of rain or snow, depending on your elevation and time of night. But uh, mostly snow with this cloudiness back to the northwest and western areas. Rain showers down over the Yukon Cuscombe Delta area. And the Cuscombe Valley generally dry. Could be some few isolated showers around there today, but mostly cloudy skies. Bering Sea, lots of clouds. And uh, frontal boundary right through here, not really looking as impressive as they did, of course, earlier in the winter. But still, gale force winds with that, slowly pushing eastward in toward uh, Adak and Atka. Had gusts uh, 50 to 60 miles an hour uh, until the front pushed through over the western Aleutian Shimia earlier on. A breakthrough here with just generally cloudy skies. Could be a few sun breaks going on over the southeast bearing and across southern Alaska as well with isolated showers west of or over the uh, Yukon Cusquam Delta areas. And then this band of snow here with that uh, weakening occluded front pushing northward into the central and uh, western Brooks Range the Long Mountains and some light snow all the way up to the central Arctic coast, mostly in the form of flurries, but uh, 
gusty winds still uh, peaking at about 52 miles an hour here over at uh, Barter Island, Kaktovik, and those areas. That uh, was also accompanied by clear skies, offshore flow there, and downsloping off the Brooks Range. But uh, winds will gradually diminish up in that area tonight, and uh, gale warnings will slowly push eastward as that front pushes eastward. So pushing on to tonight's map, that'll tend to uh, turn showery and winds will diminish here for ADAC uh, toward morning. Take a little longer for Atka, but this uh, area of rain will push into the eastern Aleutians, first Nikolsky, and then eventually in Alaska, as well as uh, up to the Pervilofs. And just uh, pretty dry conditions now. Weak high pressure here, about 1,018 millibars south of Kodiak, but a general area of high pressure, or you could say just a lack of storminess rather than a presence of high pressure. Anyway, that's going to dry it out, maybe a little bit of clearing. And uh, still some scattered showers here over the eastern interior. This band persists, lifts northward. And so you probably see light snow persisting through much in the night from the northern Koyukuk Valley right up to the southern slopes of the Brooks Range, maybe Arctic Village. And a little more showery here back to the west, but still some snow with a couple of lows here. St. Lawrence Island through the Bering Strait, southern uh, Seward Peninsula, Nome Teller, Brevik Mission, and I believe Tin City all picked up about anywhere from one to two inches of snow today. Pretty persistent there, and that'll continue, but probably lighten up later tonight. Otherwise, we've got this uh, system spreading a chance of rain in toward the southern southeast coast toward morning, and then it'll tend to wash out actually a trough here. I forgot to dash in off the coast, so uh, rain, showers down to the south, showers back to the north and northwest, tapering off around uh, Yakutat, possible afternoon showers, mountainous terrain near southern Alaska, mostly sunny Kenai Peninsula, to Kodiak Island, and isolated showers with partly mostly cloudy skies over the eastern interior, a little bit more showery back to the northwest in the form of snow showers, and then settled here, but uh, look for possible clearing over the Yukon, Kuskokwim Delta, and Valley, Rain for the Alaska Peninsula and the outlook for Sunday. Low tracks up and weakens to near Cape Newenham. That's going to bring uh, cloudier, wetter conditions, a little breezy here into southern Alaska, especially the North Gulf Coast. Exiting Kodiak Island uh, by noontime. Chance of rain pushes into Yakutat with isolated showers over the northern panhandle, although it's pretty nice down to the south. And some isolated rain or snow showers here with this trough and then to the north and north or west there, pretty good conditions coming up for uh, Sunday and Sunday afternoon. Lows tonight, uh, teens here in the northeast to lower 30s near freezing back to the southwest and near 40 over the eastern Aleutians and 40s in the panhandle. Lies tomorrow, 50 to 55, south central Alaska. Otherwise, 40s, 10 on Valley, mid to upper 20s on the Arctic coast. Lows Sunday morning back down into the 10 to 15 degree range, coldest up there over the northeast with lower 20s down into the Eagle area and a little below freezing for the Copper River Basin while the southeast coast 35 to 40 and uh, milder here back to the west, lows here 30 to 35 and in the 30s for the Aleutian areas. Otherwise, uh, kind of a contrast here for the uh, Sunday morning as you head west uh, Rise into the upper 20s there for the western Arctic coast, lower 30s for the Kotzebue Sound area. Highs for Sunday afternoon looking like this, uh, warming up, making a comeback here over the Tanana Valley, 50s, definitely 50s there, and lower to mid 50s for the southeast coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And flying weather graphics here for. Uh, Saturday morning, the uh, significant weather uh, graphic here showing a lot of IFR shifting eastward across the central Bering Sea, marginal behind it, then some more farther out to the west with a IFR zone right up into the uh, St. Lawrence Island area, Seward Peninsula on the uh, south-southwest coast through the Bering Strait, and then up along the western central Arctic coast. Interior tomorrow. Uh, Mostly marginal or IFR here, a couple IFR zones scattered around, and even less VFR, except for Cook Inlet, Kenai Peninsula, most of Kodiak Island looking uh, good VFR tomorrow to start, and then IFR here late tonight, early tomorrow morning for the Copper River Basin, uh, maybe up into the 40 mile country, marginal for the Panhandle. Tomorrow afternoon, we've got IFR sliding on in across the southern southeast coastal areas there and even up the east side along the border. Marginal VFR back up into the Wrangell Mountains, becoming VFR with uh, generally higher pressure moving in 
uh, for the afternoon here, southern Alaska, Bristol Bay, Kodiak, right up into the upper Yukon Valley areas, some lingering marginal VFR here, Koyukuk, Kobuk Valleys, and better conditions for the Arctic Coast North Slope. More widespread IFR or continuing increase here out over the Bering Sea, pushing in close to the coast, but not quite making it, but the marginal VFR will along the Yukon Delta. And for Sunday morning, zone of VFR holding here over the uh, central or south central interior areas. IFR though sliding up uh, to the northeast here, Kodiak Island and into southern Cook Inlet uh, again by Sunday morning, but uh, mostly staying off the coast here, but working into Togiak Bay in the southwest mountains. Bering Sea, IFR. Patch of IFR here around Cordova, maybe Valdez possibly with uh, some marginal stuff, uh, trying to work into the Copper River Basin, marginal for the Panhandle for the afternoon. Uh, improving here over the uh, eastern and southeast part of the uh, Panhandle. Otherwise marginal, we've got IFR Prince William Sound, bringing out to some VFR, it looks like uh, Manuska, Susitna Valley, Cook Inlet down to about Anchor Point along the eastern or western Kenai Peninsula. Good VFR here, central interior, IFR, north slope in the Arctic coast, and marginal VFR now for the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island. Still widespread IFR for the Perbolofs, Adak, Atka, Shimia too, and marginal front Alaska and the southwest interior. Passes tomorrow, Adigan, Anatovic, both occasionally marginal throughout the day Saturday. Lake Clark and Merrill starting marginal, becoming VFR during the morning hours. And for rainy, same trend, VFR uh, will occur, or you'll leave the marginal behind during the morning, and that'll last through the afternoon. Same trend for windy, as that system slowly weakens and drifts northeastward, uh, becoming VFR. Isabel, though, taking a little longer there, IFR becoming marginal. And for Mentasta, I think it'll become uh, IFR to start, becomes VFR into the afternoon. And for Tanita, marginal VFR, Trends toward VFR conditions toward noontime and portage. Same pattern there. Uh, lowest conditions early on and VFR. Chilkoot and white, occasionally marginal throughout the day. Freezing levels at the surface here, kind of right up along the west coast there, all the way into the North Tack Valley, or Kotzebue Sound region there to the Long Mountains. Otherwise, below the surface is for tomorrow morning. 2,000 feet here up into uh, roughly, looks like about uh, Knick Arm and Bristol Bay, cutting across the northern Panhandle. 4,000 feet to 5,000 feet Dixon entrance, 2,000 feet here out over the western, or out over the central Aleutians. Icing, uh, areas of light to very scattered, isolated, uh, considerable moderate rime icing or mixed conditions here. Uh, heavier stuff looks like it'll stay south of the Alaska Peninsula, otherwise icing free over the interior. And uh, areas of uh, light to, again, very isolated, considerable moderate, uh, probably mixed type icing here for the southeast coast. Jet stream tomorrow, uh, westerly flow into the panhandle, keeps it a little unsettled there, but uh, kind of a classic uh, jet stream here with uh, upper level lows to the north, high pressure there over the northeast Pacific, and the flow at about 90 knots. And for 9,000 feet, ridging popping up into the interior by uh, midday and tomorrow afternoon here in the uh, interior of Alaska with light winds. Uh, 15 to 20 knots up along the west coast, maybe 25 western Arctic coast, 30 knots into the uh, panhandle, and night or 3,000 feet, about 30 knots here for the Aleutians, light in the interior, turbulence shaping up like this, moderate chop, Alaska Peninsula, east central, eastern Aleutians, and the western Brooks Range. Floating hundreds of miles from Earth, astronauts get a unique perspective of our planet. While they might recognize landmarks, space is the only place they can see the very edge of our planet's atmosphere. From orbit, particularly looking at the horizon, did bring to mind how thin the atmosphere is. It's like an onion skin around this great big ball of the Earth. This uppermost layer of Earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere, also overlaps with the very beginning of space. It's the job of NASA's new mission, GOLD, the Global Scale Observations of the Limon Disk Instrument, to study this region, a region that isn't just for astronauts to explore, but that affects humans every day down on the ground. For one thing, this layer of the upper atmosphere helps protect us from harmful radiation and energy emanating from the sun. But in our modern society, it does so much more. It affects the smartphone that sits in your pocket and the radio waves that guide our airplanes. The ionosphere is a crucial layer of the atmosphere through which our communications and GPS signals travel. 
And when this region changes, it impacts those communication signals. Changes can occur above this region from the sun's activity, also known as space weather. Changes can also occur below from Earth's weather, such as hurricanes and wind patterns. Gold connects the dots between how space weather and Earth's weather shape the upper reaches of the atmosphere. But this region isn't easy to study. The ionosphere spans roughly 60 to 400 miles from Earth's surface, which is too high for aircraft and scientific balloons, and the lower regions are too low to easily study with satellites. What are attainable, however, are the swaths of red and green light shining out from the upper atmosphere. Formed when the sun's rays hit atmospheric molecules, this light, named airglow, comes from green and red bands of glowing gas. Some of the airglow is invisible to our eyes, shining in infrared and ultraviolet light, which can only be seen with scientific instrumentation. Taking advantage of our planet's natural glow is gold. The gold instrument, which is about the size of a mini-fridge, is hitching a ride on a commercial communication satellite, SES-14. The satellite's orbit lies 22,000 miles above Earth, where it can record images in ultraviolet light to monitor changes in airglow across the globe. These images give information on the temperature, density and composition of particles in the upper atmosphere. Gold collects these observations faster than any mission has ever done before. It captures an image of Earth's entire disk every 30 minutes, allowing scientists to see how the upper atmosphere evolves throughout the day. Gold joins a host of missions studying the very nature of space around Earth, the Sun and planets. As NASA ventures farther and farther from home, knowing the nature of space itself is crucial for our journey to understand our solar system and beyond. There's a new class of chemical compounds impacting the Earth's ozone layer and raising concerns among some scientists. But a new NASA analysis indicates stratospheric ozone could actually be impacted more by climate change and the continued release of already banned chemicals. The Earth's ozone hole is showing signs of recovery, decades after the landmark agreement called the Montreal Protocol that banned many chemical compounds harmful to the ozone layer. So we know the Montreal Protocol was a huge success. This was signed in the late 1980s when scientists and policymakers from around the world gathered together to try to save the ozone layer. The chemicals they regulated persist in the atmosphere for many decades. They thin the ozone layer and they create a seasonal hole over Antarctica. They basically take away part of our planet's natural sunscreen and that increases the risk of skin cancer and damage to plants. Scientists have projected the ozone hole could disappear almost completely by about 2075, but several factors could delay that recovery. There are some industrial compounds that are not banned by the Montreal Protocol, but as they enter the atmosphere, they will also hurt the ozone layer. But the unregulated compounds have a short lifespan in the atmosphere unlike the chlorofluorocarbons that were originally regulated. So they have a short-lived impact on ozone, and we don't think they'll delay recovery by more than a few years. We projected by 2050, more than half of the ozone-depleting compounds in the atmosphere will come from long-lived substances banned by the protocol. Because these compounds stay in the air for such a long time compared to the unregulated, short-lived compounds, they will have a disproportionate and lingering impact on ozone. So any non-compliance with the protocol can have significant consequences. And the really big uncertainty in ozone layer recovery is climate change. There are many naturally produced ozone depleting substances that are emitted by the oceans. And as the oceans continue to warm due to climate change, those emissions will increase and that will further delay ozone recovery. Scientists want to better understand how climate change will affect ozone recovery. This is a hard problem. As a scientific community, we need to work on this major issue. We now have a powerful new tool to simulate atmosphere and its interaction with land and ocean to study this issue. And that's what we're going to do.
How can you see the atmosphere? The answer is blowing in the wind. Tiny particles known as aerosols are carried by the air around the globe. This visualization uses data from NASA satellites combined with our knowledge of physics and meteorology to track three aerosols, dust, smoke, and sea salt. Sea salt, shown here in blue, is picked up by winds passing over the ocean. As tropical storms and hurricanes form, the salt particles are concentrated into the spiraling shape we all recognize. With their movements, we can follow the formation of Hurricane Irma and see the dust from the Sahara, shown in tan, get washed out of the storm center by the rain. Advances in computing speed allow scientists to include more details of these physical processes in their simulations of how the aerosols interact with the storm systems. The increased resolution of the computer simulation is apparent in fine details like the hurricane bands spiraling counterclockwise. Computer simulations let us see how different processes fit together and evolve as a system. By using mathematical models to represent nature, we can separate the system into component parts and better understand the underlying physics of each. Today's research improves next year's weather forecasting ability. Hurricane Ophelia was very unusual. It headed northeast, pulling in Saharan dust and smoke from wildfires in Portugal, carrying both to Ireland and the UK. This aerosol interaction was very different from other storms of the season. As computing speed continues to increase, scientists will be able to bring more scientific details into the simulations, giving us a deeper understanding of our home planet. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Today's sea ice analysis, uh, still showing the uh, ice here, St. Lawrence Island on up and even north of the Bering Strait there, kind of in a slow dissolve here, and to a lesser extent along, the, along and off the western Arctic coast. And uh, later on, toward the end of the three to five day period, it looks like northerly winds will come back and that may start to advance some of the southward again. Uh, but uh, nothing too serious or drastic. And for this uh, coastal water forecast here along the southeast coast down south, west-southwesterly is 10 to 15 knots, and uh, west-southwest also on the north coast, but more in the 10-knot range there with seas running 6 to 7 feet. South 20 for Lynn Canal in the afternoon, 4-foot seas. Otherwise light and variable winds, 10 knots for the central and southern inside waters. And that becomes a little more general out of the northwest here for the central inside water areas, northwest 15 on the uh, south coast, central coast, uh, west 15, up north, uh, winds become south of 15, they actually pick up to 25 knots uh, over the eastern north Gulf Coast. Lynn Canal, another day, afternoon winds, 20 knots from the south. Prince William Sound, northwest at 10 tomorrow, southwest 15 for the eastern north Gulf Coast, swinging back around to northwest at 20. And then uh, Barron Islands, west 20 knots, same thing for Kamishak Bay, and Cook Inlet, northwest at 10, so pretty light winds with two-foot seas. And gales coming into the picture here for the Barron Islands on Sunday, southeast coming up to 35 knots, those turn easterly right into Kamishak Bay at 35. North winds south of the Forelands pick up about 20 knots, otherwise uh, 15 out of the northeast there, coming out of Knick Arm for northern Cook Inlet, and east 20 for Prince William Sound. A little bit of an increase with seas really not increasing much, about three feet. Small craft advisories for the North Gulf Coast, east southeast 25 to 30. Kodiak Island tomorrow, east 10 knots, light winds there. Small craft advisories here along the uh, Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula right up to Sitkanak, Sitkanak. And southeast 20 here for the Bering Sea side of the peninsula. Light easterlies at 15 for Bristol Bay. Those uh, pick up a little bit, 20 knots out of the southeast there for Bristol Bay, and uh, south to southeast, 15 to 20 here for the Alaska Peninsula, 15 knot winds, Castle Cape to Sitkanak, east 25, small craft advisories for Shelikoff Strait, and south winds at 20 knots on the east side of Kodiak Island, sees it about 8 feet. Fox Island tomorrow, small craft advisories, uh, mostly southeast winds, 25 to a size 30 knots, 
and we'll see if we win Mac Island, we'll see the 30 knot winds. Adakanatka south at 20, and winds diminish as you head west all the way down to 10 knots there from Kiska to Shemia. And for Sunday, they'll swing around to the north at 15. Sees uh, up around 9 feet there, kind of light variable winds through here from Kiska over toward Adak. And then north to northwest to west, 15 to 20. And then for the Fox Islands, we've got, uh, call it south to southeast, average it out there, 15 to 20 knots with seas running 4 to 10 feet. Southwest coast, southeast, 20 knots in the forecast for tomorrow. Same thing for St. Matthew Island. Small craft advisories through the Purple Off, southeast 25, seas 9 feet. Southerlies, 15 for St. Lawrence Island and Norton Sound, probably into the Bering Strait as well. And then for Sunday, northeast here, Norton Sound, St. Lawrence Island, and north of Nunavak Island to St. Matthew Island. Northeast 20 knots, seas 48 feet, northeast 15, Pervilofs, east 20, south of Nunavak Island. Eastern Boulevard Sea Coast, those winds uh, coming down, from, especially from today up there, slow, dim slowly diminishing tonight and into tomorrow, but hanging on to the brisk wind advisories through the afternoon. Otherwise, east 20 for the central coast, or to the central coast. And then they become south, lighter, 15 knots here, all the way down to Cape Thompson, south of Cape Thompson, southeast at 15. And those become east of 15 for the day Sunday. Otherwise, not too bad. Pretty light winds, Cape Thompson, Cape Beaufort, 10 knots. Southeast 15 on the west side. And then 15, or mostly 20 knot winds here on the eastern Beaufort Sea coast, 15 on the central coast. Tonight's uh, forecast. Showers diminishing here over the panhandle with uh, moisture streaming up. Uh, could bring a chance of rain. Port Alexander down to maybe Craig Cloak late tonight and drying out North Gulf Coast. Uh, some clearing Kodiak Island into Cook Inlet and showers lingering, kind of holding the entire night. Uh, rain or snow depending on your elevation, the time of night here, Copper River Basin, but uh, scattering out to the west here and the winter weather advisory ends tonight over the eastern Alaska range. Rain pushes in the Alaska Peninsula tomorrow, wet for the Panhandle, and then wet for the North Gulf Coast on Sunday. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.